Thank you, Andy, and thank you uh, to, the, to the band, to the worship leaders for leading us in worship this morning. I've been meaning to tell you something for the last several weeks, but it just kind of, um, it's not that I for, forget, but it's, uh, no, I must be, I'm, I might as well be honest, I, I forget. <laughs> Yeah, it's not that I forgot, I just don't remember. Yeah, yeah, I mislocated my memory, yes. So, but about a month ago, um, there's a lady in our church that, um, out of compassion and love for our family, decided that she was going to make me uh, some uh, fresh uh, sushi. And, and she brought it that morning, and uh, it was, it was uh, very delicious to the point where I think that if she did a DNA test, that there would be Japanese uh, in, her, in, her, in her DNA. But I want to say thanks to the Lord for leeway, for, uh, for making that sushi for me. I, 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 was, I, I was so blessed by it. And, it, and, it, and it's really a representation of the love that this church uh, has shown both to, to myself and to Donna. And I just really want to acknowledge that and say thank you to Leeway and thanks to all of you for the love that you share. So this morning, um, it's St. Patrick's Day, so happy St. Patrick's Day. Donna reminded me this morning that I am half Irish. Um, <laughs> And so I, she said, do you have anything green? I've said, well, if I do, I wouldn't know because I'm colorblind. Um, so I have this app on my phone. It, phones are great when, when they work, right? So this smartphone, since I'm a dummy when it comes to color, uh, I have this app where you can just, just, you can just you know, scan any color and it tells you. And lo and behold, there's some green. I understand there's some green in this, in this tie. So that's why I wore it. Now, many of you who say, hey, nice tie, it's colorful, it's this and that. Um, but if you ever, if, I'm sure you have, where you know that you know that you know that the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something. Have you ever, have you ever had those moments? Raise your hand if you've had those moments. The Holy Spirit was telling you, you, you got to do this. Well, the Holy Spirit's telling me I have to do something this morning. And so I'm going to do it. Okay, I'm going to take this tie off right here. Okay, I'm going to take it off. And uh, I'm going to give it to the first guy who said, I love that tie. I wish I had one. <laughs> Mark, come on up here. I want to give you this tie. This is, this is, this is your tie. Now, there's only one catch, okay? So, wherever and however, whenever you wear that tie, let it come out in a conversation how you got it, <laughs> and tell somebody about Jesus. You just say, I was at church, and, you know, God loved me enough to give me a tie that morning. <laughs> yes. Now, don't everybody run out and buy me a tie for Father's Day or my birthday, because I have plenty of ties, okay? Um, I have ties in Florida, I have ties in Japan, I have ties all over the place. That, that was a joke, you know what I mean? Ties, like connections, okay. Yeah, oh, man, that went over like a lead balloon. Okay, so a couple of announcements here. First is um, that next Sunday is, is uh, church cleanup for the English ministry, so I want to Make sure that you are, uh, are aware of that. Next Sunday is also Palm Sunday, okay? So we get to uh, clean the church, palm fresh smell, uh, you know, uh, on Palm Sunday, okay? So I pray that you will participate in that next week. Um, 
Of course, we want to remind you about the parking lot that I announced last week. There's, if, if you're not sure where the compact spaces and where the big spaces are, there's a map out there. Somebody actually produced a map, and it's on the, in the lobby on the information desk out there. So if you want to know where, the, where you can park your car, okay? Sherry, your car is so small, um, you can... Parking in You can park, yeah, you can <laughs> drive, it, and drive it right inside, yes. Yes, it could be like a drive-in church, you know? Uh, but uh, so just be aware of that. And then also, what was the other one that's up there? Do we have? Oh, yes, um, Good Friday. So this year it's bilingual. For the past years it's been in Mandarin only, but this year it's bilingual. Um, and we want to make it available to the whole church. And uh, so the English ministry is obviously invited. And um, it, uh, it, it's just a, a, a wonderful time to reflect on the suffering uh, of the Lord and to remember his sacrifice. And so let me encourage you and invite you to, to be a part of that. I'll be bringing a short message uh, about the cross, and uh, so we look forward to seeing everybody there. All right, let's dig in to our passage today. Uh, if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 5, verse 12. The real reason I gave the tie away is because when you wear a tie, you're supposed to button your coat. Did you know that? When you wear a tie, you're supposed to button your coat. Well. It's a little tight around the midriff. <laughs> and so I thought, if I didn't have a tie on, hey, right? Okay, and I just noticed up there that passage is wrong. It says 1 through 11, but it's actually 12 through 16. Typo uh, to who, whoever did that um, probably needs to be fired. <laughs> Wait, that's me. I did. Okay. One day, a professor demonstrated to his class the power of an electromagnet. So he placed two pounds of nails on a table with the wires of an electromagnet under the table. And when he flipped the switch, the nails came together and he was able to form the nails into various shapes as long as the current was on. But when the current was cut off, the nails fell back into the pile. This reminds us that as long as the current of God, the Holy Spirit, runs through us, we have unity with God and can, he can form us into any shape he chooses for his purpose. Isn't that a great picture? Today we're going to talk about uh, miracles. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about telling people about Jesus. Let me pray real quick, and then we'll dig in. Father, I just pray in the next few minutes that you will remove my own uh, self and that you would speak through me and proclaim the good news of Jesus and that our people will be not just inspired, but challenged to live a life the way you want us to. Challenge us, Lord, and give us courage to step out in faith and, and live the life that you've called us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week we looked at Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, where Ananias and Sapphira's actions gave the appearance of, of being uh, one with another, one with one another, but their deceitful hearts stopped the flow of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You can't be in one accord with one another without engaging your heart. Their hearts were wicked. Does that mean that the Holy Spirit is less powerful than the forces of sin? Not at all. 
but it does mean that the Holy Spirit will not share residency with any other spirit. He will not compromise. That's how much God respects man's free will. As I said last week, two people dropping dead in the middle of church service could have been catastrophic for the church. And the future would have certainly been in doubt. But the very opposite thing occurs. Most of us pray for revival in our land. We want God to move in ways we've never seen before. How many of you pray for revival in our land? And we want God to move. We want, we want to see God do great things. But what we must realize is that as long as that long before we can experience any kind of miraculous moving of the Holy Spirit in our nation, there must be revival in the church. And before revival is taking place, takes place in the church, there must be a cleansing of the heart and each individual person who professes Jesus as Lord. And so while we pray for revival in our land, what we really need to pray for is revival in our own hearts. It has to start with us. Ananias and Sapphira rejected the opportunity to repent and reconnect with the Holy Spirit and therefore had to be separated from the unified church. So, the church flourished. And then we come to Acts chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. Some of your translations may say they were all in one accord. Some will say that this is the first time that Hondas are mentioned in the Bible because they were in one accord. Brunch. Brunch, yes. <laughs> so when you read that, you think, first of all, what are signs and wonders? Because I think we need to make sure that we, we have a biblical understanding of what signs and what wonders are what they mean. Signs, by definition, are miracles. But they are not just mere miracles. They are miracles to corroborate or authenticate something. In this case, and in all cases, to authenticate the absolute power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ over everything. God gave to the people of that day very clear and, pre and precise signs to connect together his power with what the apostles were proclaiming. It went hand in hand. On the one hand, the apostles were saying, Jesus is Lord, and on the other hand, God was proving are providing proof of their statement. Wonders here, it, uh, they're, it's miraculous wonder. It's done to elicit a reaction from onlookers. It's an extraordinary event with uh, its supernatural effect left on all witnessing it. In plain language, in our language, it leaves those who witness to say, it's clearly not of this world. It's the things that can't be explained in human terms. It's the kind of thing that leaves man wondering, how did it happen? How is it possible? People ask why God doesn't 
show himself through signs and wonders today, like we read about in the book of Acts? Well, the short answer is he does. He does so where and when he needs to. If you ask missionaries in remote areas where Christianity is not widespread and there isn't a single Bible translation in their language, signs and wonders are a common occurrence. But here in the U.S. and other nations where Christianity is in abundance, God chooses mostly to make himself known through his followers, us. And when we are not available, he will use signs and wonders. That's not to say miracles don't exist in our midst. They do all the time. But we have to remember that the reason for miracles is not to make our lives better, but to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Amen. That's why signs and wonders occur, to proclaim Jesus. I would like to say here that there are Christians who are constantly looking for signs and wonders. They, they want to see something miraculous. They hear of some reflection on a building that resembles an angel or that some statue of Jesus is bleeding and they'll spend thousands of dollars to go and witness it. Now here's a truth bomb, okay? Let me drop one on you. Not all signs and wonders are from God. In fact, if you turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. You would be wise if you left here today and if all you remembered was that not all signs and wonders are from God. You would be ahead. Let that sink in for a bit. Not everything that you see that's supernatural, that's unexplainable, and dare I say, a lot of that is in what we witness are in churches, this holy laughter stuff and this uncontrollable body movements. It's a spirit, all right, but it's not the spirit of God. It's a sign, it's a wonder, but it is false directly from Satan himself. Verse 13, none of the rest dare, dare join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Now, this verse is kind of confusing, at least for me when I read it, uh, when you first read it, because it seems to contradict other parts of the passage. Is it saying no one wanted to join them? No, it's not saying that because... It says, in fact, in the very next verse, that the, the, the numbers that were added were more than ever. So you have all these people joining the ranks, but then you had all the rest of the people, and of those people, none of them dared to join them. So it's not saying nobody wanted to join them, because there were many who were joining, but all the ones who didn't join, they, they, for whatever reason, they dare not join. They didn't want any part of it. 
And it says, And God's people held the apostles in high esteem. Verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. See what I mean? Multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Now here's where it gets a little weird, in my opinion. Because this sounds like you know, like a TV evangelist kind of thing, right? Maybe it's because I've seen so many TV evangelists using all kinds of gimmicks to solicit donations. I've seen many through the years. My, uh, I can't call it a favorite, but my, the one that just struck me the most was this TV evangelist, uh, calling out to his audience, and he said, if you will send me $25, I will send you a shower cap, a shower cap with my handprint on it. And if you, when you get that shower cap, you put that shower cap on your head, and then you will be anointed because it will have my handprint on it. In today's culture, we have so-called prophets and prophetess laying their handkerchiefs on the sick because, you know, Paul did that in Acts. Or using their $30,000 suit jacket to create a vortex for people to encounter the rushing mighty wind as if somehow he is conjuring up the Holy Spirit. Some people rush to that kind of display because they are desperate to be part of something supernatural. And as I said before, the devil is capable of performing the supernatural. We just read that in 2 Thessalonians. What this passage here tells us is not that there was some supernatural power in Peter's shadow. Remember, just a few months before this, he was afraid of his own shadow. He, went, he ran and he hid. But that the sick and afflicted were in desperate need. That's what we're seeing here. They were in desperate need of healing. And they were willing to try anything in hopes of being healed. And God chose to heal them. Every one of them. Verse 16. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. The word all here means each and every one of them. It's not just a figure of speech. It's like, you know, you went to a party and everyone was having a good time. Well, and maybe not everyone, but just about everyone. That's not what this means here. When it says all, it means each and every single person was healed. Talk about supernatural. Talk about signs and wonders. And this display of power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it continues throughout the book of Acts. It doesn't matter who's proclaiming the gospel. Right now it's Peter and the apostles, and later on it's Paul. It, it doesn't matter. This power and authority of the gospel is on display. These signs were given in a particular culture for a specific purpose. But because God did it there, it does not automatically mean that he will do the same in every period of history or in every culture. 
It doesn't mean that God is not active in every culture or less compassionate, but that God knows what every individual needs and that every believer in Christ is required to walk by faith and not by sight. Miracles continue today, but the purpose of miracles remain the same today as it was during Peter's day. They were not for the comfort of God's people. They were for Christ to be lifted up and for the message of the gospel to be authenticated. At the end of July 2022, Donna was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. <clears throat> it was devastating news, to say the least. Some of you have received equally challenging news of an incurable disease, a family conflict, a wayward child or a job loss. If it's anything like we've experienced, your faith has been tested. You pray for healing, you pray for restoration, you pray for reunion, And you know that God is fully capable of answering your prayers. And yet he remains silent. You begin to question why. You wonder if it's because of you. If it's because you're not doing something right. You wonder if God is punishing you. You can even begin to doubt God's existence. Because if he was real, why would he remain silent, right? God has not changed. His character has not changed. His power has not been diminished. His compassion is still the same. And his desire for all to be saved remains the same. So why does God not heal cancer? Why does he allow his people to suffer? First of all, do you know that it's in our sin nature to always want what we don't have? You know, if we're tall and bald, we look at someone who has hair and we go, I wish I had hair. And then the person that's short with hair says, I wish I was tall. <laughs> we, we, we always look at what we don't have and we always see what other people have and we wish we had what they had. It's just, it's just our sin nature. It's something we had to fight against all, all, all the time. And so we look at the early church and we think, if only we could see God move in miraculous ways as they did, our lives would be so much more meaningful. Oh, to be able to, to go back and to live during those days and to walk with Jesus and to see all these miraculous signs and wonders. What a, what a wonderful thing that would be. And if the apostles could see us in the 21st century, they probably would say, you guys don't know how good you have it. Amen. Look at all the Bibles you have. You have so many different translations. We didn't have any. <laughs> and in languages, you can read. Oh, and you can read. They couldn't even read most of them. 
and it, it, it and you can read without a candle. And you can carry hundreds of books, hundreds of Christian books and commentaries. You can carry them wherever you go. Everywhere you go, you can carry them in that little, that little device you call a smartphone. You don't know how good you have it. Did you know that all but one of the apostles died a martyr's death? All but one. And he probably had to live as survivor's guilt. James was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Some of them were run through with spears and arrows. One of them was skinned alive. Some were stoned to death. Only John died of natural causes, and that was only after they tried to kill him by boiling him to death. But miraculously, he escaped. But where was the miracle for the rest of them? While others suffered and died, John suffered and lived. The point is here that association with the gospel meant that it was a almost guaranteed journey of suffering and suffer they did for the advancement of the gospel. You know the problem with Christianity today? The problem with Christianity today is it's not really related to suffering, at least in the United States. We think somebody flipped us off on the highway on the 118 because we have a Christian bumper sticker and we call that suffering. <laughs> I think they understood that miracles were not to make their lives better, but to advance the gospel. The reason I think that is because time after time, after God delivered them from, by some miracle, he delivered them from prison, delivered them from the midst where they were about to be stoned, and God delivered them, then they went right back to doing that which where they were, that they were forbidden to do. For them, a miracle just bought them another day to tell people about Jesus. This was their mission. And it is our mission. Make no mistake about it. If you join this church and you're a member of this church, you're part of the, the, the body of Christ, your mission, my mission, is to tell people about Jesus, not to live comfortable lives. If God's given you a comfortable life, God bless you. That's wonderful. If you're relatively healthy, that's wonderful, but that just means God requires more of you to tell people about Jesus. It doesn't matter if you are suffering to death or suffering to live. Tell people about Jesus. Don't wait for some miracle to come before you tell people about Jesus because the miracle you seek may never come. 
If he chooses to give you a miracle, to deliver you with a miracle, praise God. But if he chooses not to give you a miracle, praise God. On January 8th, 1956, a group of 20-something men, five in all, landed a Piper PA-14 aircraft on the riverbanks in a remote part of Ecuador in an effort to make contact with the Wadani tribe in hopes of sharing the gospel with them. The friendly and curious tribesmen that they encountered that afternoon we returned later that night and slaughtered all five missionaries. Including Jim Elliott, Ed McCauley, Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, and Nate Saint. They needed a miracle that night. But God was silent. They died taking the gospel to a group of people who had never heard the good news before. But the story doesn't end there. And there would come a miracle. just not in their temporary lifetime. If you want to read more about it, or even there's a, a movie made about it, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, wrote a book, Through Gates of Splendor. I think it should be required reading for every Christian. Teenagers. Go find that book and read it. There's a movie made, it's called The End of the Spear. You, you know, if you have a, a short attention span and you, you can't sit and read a 300 page book, then watch the movie. <laughs> The miracle of the story is that some of the wives, including Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, with their children, returned to that very village and lived with the tribe. And over a short period of time, everyone in the village became Christians, including the chief. That's a miracle. An entry later discovered in one of Jim's journals, was, it was a paraphrase of a, a quote by an English clergyman, Philip Henry. Jim's version goes like this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim knew that he could not keep this temporary life, that sooner or later it would come to an end. But he also knew that there is eternal life, a life he cannot lose. And it changed the way he looked at life. It changed the way he lived. Let it change the way you live. Miracle or not. Let's pray. Father,
we humbly come before you and we open our hearts to you. Lord, we, we want to receive what you have for us, what you want to teach us, how you want us to live. Lord, forgive us for doubting you. Forgive us, Lord, for even maybe being angry at you because you have not provided a miracle. You have not answered our prayer. Lord, forgive us for focusing on signs and wonders and, and what, our need for them over our desire to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, from this day forward, let us be a, a people who will be faithful in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Lord, some of us, we have used excuses, excuses for a long time that we, we don't know what to say or we don't know anybody or we don't, we don't have any knowledge. And Lord, we have used so many excuses. We haven't had opportunities. Help us, Lord to be courageous enough to throw all those excuses aside to share Jesus with somebody, no matter how old or how young we are. We share Jesus with our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family members, our sons and daughters, our parents, whoever you put us in contact with. Let that be our mission. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.